Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Brandon. Hello. How's it going? Super. Were you guys actually rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay. <laughs> I was just making sure I was, I've been saying Brendan in my head. Yeah, it's a common, it's a common thing, so don't worry about it. Does anyone ever pull the let's go Brandon joke? Uh, no, no, it's long overdue. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, you know, that my last name is let's go, you know. Okay. But, uh, so Brandon, let's oh. go. <laughs> How's it going? Good, good. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, like we've, we've been going back and forth quite a while now. I've been, I've been reading your stuff, um. On uh, particularly on on the history of war propaganda, and the way that that governments and the military industrial complex have have manipulated public perceptions of of what we should be doing. It's always pro war, um, and we've been going back and forth trying to find the time to get get you to actually be here. So mm-hmm. so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I want to start with an article. Just last week, I was um, celebrating and promoting responsible statescraft as a place that I go for for really important content that that somehow is not part of this manipulation and propaganda that we get from uh, corporate media. Mm-hmm. And you had written a piece in there, I think, uh, quite a while ago now, maybe three or four months ago, yeah. on the um, shocking ancient history of the U.S. government's manipulation of public perceptions and the media and the way it, the way it corrupted the narrative. And, and of course, all, all things bad in the U.S. go back to Woodrow Wilson. Pretty much, yeah. I should have known. Right. I should have just guessed. Right. <laughs> so what did, what did it start that story for me? Yes, yeah, so from the beginning uh, of this country's sustained imperial project, if you want to use the, uh, the heavy I word, uh, the U.S. government, either explicitly or implicitly has used its various organs and via regulation um, via, or law enforcement in terms of uh, the Sedition Act in the case of Woodrow Wilson to manipulate public opinion, to to either eliminate dissent or suppress it or elevate uh, interventionist narratives uh, that would support, that would support uh, the war effort or various other projects uh, related to war. So it, well, like you said, it really, it really starts with Woodrow Wilson, um, with something that some historians have called the information state. So you know, Wilson, Wilson and his administration knew that that support for the war was 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 at best mixed for American uh, involvement in, in the war. So in order to drum up that support, uh, once the war got started, he created something called the the uh, committee uh, the committee for public information, headed by a man named George. Creel. Not even slightly Orwellian. No, not it's pre Orwellian. It's, it's pre proto Orwellian. Yeah. Um, so Creel was was very much one of these sort of progressive muckraking journalist uh, journalist types, and uh, he very much he he totally agreed with uh, Wilson's project, and so the CPI you know, injected, you know, what we would call propaganda into the bloodstream, into the media um, ecosystem. But not only that, they also red flagged things for the post office for enforcement through the Sedition Act. So to to, to get, you know, uh, people who resisted conscription, you know, these kinds of things. And so beyond just the CPI, you also had the Sedition Act. I think it was something like 1,600 Americans were charged under... um, under that act, uh, various pacifists and the like, uh, people of various Christian Does the Sedition Act precede um, the U.S. entry into World War One? I? I think it was right r- 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 about the same time, yeah. Because yeah. one, like, what I little, little I understand about war, that, it yeah. was like you... It was like six months before the war, something you, like that, yeah. Conveniently, you yeah. can't criticize Woodrow right. Wilson. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And, you know, of course, some... Um, um, and so, yeah, so that was the uh, legal mechanism, and then also there was there was the uh, the CPS. So that that that's the first iteration, you know, of this project, uh, and and the backlash to it was was quite fierce. Once once Americans at the end of the war become disillusioned with the way that the war ended, particularly through the Treaty of Versailles and all the machinations that went on there, with the victorious uh, Allied powers, they start to turn against the war, and then um, revelations to the, to the CPI's true mission and true expanse come out. 
immediately after. People are horrified, including people who were part who were part of the project, like Walter Lippmann too, was was uh, was quite disturbed. Um, and so that coupled with revelations about British, about the British intelligence doing much of the same work, leads to you know a huge backlash against propaganda. There's you know there's, a, there's really something of a propaganda scare in the 1920s, is you know, fear of mass communications and advertising. Uh, and so that carries us up up through uh, World War II, where the next iteration becomes just a little bit softer. Yeah, it's it's fascinating that that how history may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes yeah. in this case because there you have this 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 agency created by executive order yep. that conveniently is propagandizing what Woodrow Wilson wants to do, and they're they're reading your mail basically. Yep. Yeah. So. Why are we still doing this? I, I, I this reminds me perhaps of, <laughs> yeah. of some alphabet agency. You know, maybe it's the FBI or the CIA um, monitoring my tweets to make sure I don't say anything disrespectful to Anthony Fauci. Yeah, well, it's gotten a lot softer, right? And that's it's in some ways it's gotten more pernicious because because it's not as as overt, right? Um, with the exception of a few whistleblowers, unfortunately, who have been you know are being dragooned under you know various espionage laws and for most of us it's 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 softer right and i think that that really comes about through the second world war um yet again the united states has to to uh get support going for the war it was it was sort of split you know depending upon you know who, which polls you believe and how those questions were worded and so uh roosevelt who was counseled by george creel who was still alive at the time to re-implement the, the cpi he said he said no and instead decided to work through work through uh surrogates in the press um you know uh Roosevelt did face a lot of hostile press, mainly from you know the Tribune and in the in the, in the uh, Scripps Howard network. But he also had many many you know f- uh, friends in the press and also in 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 Hollywood. So rather than overt, it was it was more you know, you know public private partnerships as yeah. as as we, you know, as we might call it. But that was just the information side. There was a a heavier hand in terms of, of investigations that went on through through, through the uh, through the FBI. They surveilled uh, the America First Committee and some other um, some some other folks who posed entry into the war. Uh, and yet again, British intelligence was was involved, doing much of 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 the same work within full view of the federal government. But unlike World War II, the revelations of this uh, they don't come out until until the early 60s there was a series of like memoirs and stuff that were published and it doesn't draw the same level of outrage right because the war it was it was it was a different war different enemy different outcome you know great britain is no longer seen as a as a threat anymore so it's like, oh okay so it, it so it it becomes it becomes channelized with conservative circles i mean they're they're pretty pissed by the, by the 60s because they find out but by then the sort of liberal narrative about america and the world has moved on and and and, and and the outrage doesn't doesn't come. So, what is the the mechanism for people discovering? Uh, let's go back to World War One and the exposure of of this censorship machine. Um, is it is it public records are finally forced open to the public? Is that is that what happens? I'm t- I'm trying to wonder because because we know why the Twitter files happened, yeah. but but why do people find out that there's these clandestine operations that the government's manipulating their they're thinking on war. Well, George Creel admitted it. He re- he actually wrote a memoir <laughs> in 1920. He's and brag- said, bragging about it. He, bra- right? he bragged yeah. about it. Yeah, and he actually he had a phrase. Uh, I probably won't be able to get the quote, but he said, "In in order to save democracy, we couldn't worry about the details of democracy." It's funny. Um, so I, I copied that quote because <laughs> yeah. because it, it rang in my ears. Um. With the existence of democracy itself at stake. There was no time to think about the details of democracy. Yep. It yeah. was, again, pretty pretty Orwellian before it was cool. Um, well, it's it, it's that existential thinking, right? In World War One, if you truly do believe that the that the you know that the Prussian military machine threatens the world, and you you can justify anything, right? At that point, same thing with same thing with the Second World War, and and and, and for and at least for 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 the British portion of that it was also memoirs that came out in the early 1960s but uh, the true extent of FDR's spying uh, I think parts of that came out with the Church and Pike commissions and then again in the 1990s there was a historian who did uh, the Freedom of Information Act requests and got those documents uh, I think about 94 95 so it, it it's been more in dribs and drabs than, than uh, during the first world war 
At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. Who was who said uh, war is the health of the state? It was Randolph Bourne, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, because one of uh, one of the consequences of uh, setting up all of this censorship and 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 scaring the American public into thinking that this is an existential threat is the radical expansion of the FBI. Yeah. This is this is when it became a monster because it was fairly small. Yeah, it was something like I think it was 300 agents or something like that going into the war, and I think it, it increases by a order of magnitude, you know, several thousand agents with a much larger budget and a pretty large writ. I mean, it was it was you know not only to look into left wing extremism in the form of communism, but also various other illiberal groups on the right, like the Boone and the Silver Shirts. But then that quickly expands to the America First Committee, uh, you know, and you know they. And, and what was that? Explain that to people. So the America First Committee was a pressure group uh, that started in, 19, in um, 1940 uh, to keep, to advocate for the United States to stay out of the war. Um, started out as a student organization at Yale, uh, quickly expanded to, to a larger um, um, organization for the um, general public. It moves to the uh, Midwest, becomes kind of associated with conservative business interests in the Midwest. Uh, and Roosevelt, as far as I can tell, and as far as uh, most historians have, have gleaned, he sincerely thought that they were a front group for the Boone or, or, you know, or uh, Nazi Germany. So the FBI is, is tasked to surveil them. Um, they gather derogatory information, um, you know, uh, issue that to friendly senators like uh, uh, Claude Pepper from uh, Florida was a particularly staunch interventionist and took great interest in the FBI's um, information gathering. And they also took, uh, took tips from the general public. And so one of the, one of the more disturbing things for me was, was reading, those, re- reading those letters. Um, again, they're all on archive.org. You can read them yourself. And you know, people sincerely, you know, it was like they were you know, almost LARPing, right? Like yeah. they, they're part of this. It's, it was like kind of a snitch culture, yeah. right? Um, and some of them, you know, to, uh, some of them in their writings, they, they, they really aired some truly disturbing thoughts, right? They, they, they fantasized about, you know, putting America firsters in concentration camps or, you know, executing them. Uh, yeah, I recall the phrase, put them up against the wall. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, th- you know, thank you. Know, thank, oh, well, Japanese Americans aside, thankfully it didn't it didn't come to that for the general public, and you know, and it, it it makes you wonder, right? Like, had those people been born and born in Germany, right? Mm-hmm. What would their life would have looked like? Yeah. Um, so to see the state provide the incentives to the public, and then there is this there is this feedback loop, right? Because in none of the responses to to these people does the fbi say well maybe not right like it's always it there's there's like a pat on the head right there's a sort of reinforcement for it so historians who have who have studied this have argued and i I tend to agree that uh this creates a scare a brown scare right fear of fascism and that this this and that fdr knowingly or maybe at least tacitly gen this up in the american public to universalize the fear of um of fascism overseas so um Anything in defense of democracy because there's a fascist under every bed. Sounds familiar. Sounds yeah. familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does sort of sound familiar. Um, the uh, it what's fascinating about this to me is that it, it sort of sheds and and I didn't know this history at the time, but it sheds um, a different frame to think about Russia Gate and something like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder about this, and I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a Trump fan at all. But the one thing that, that, that I would respect him for is, is raising questions about our endless military intervention. And for whatever reasons he had, he, he called out um, uh, the war in Iraq during yeah. his campaign, and it doesn't seem unrelated to me that they tried <laughs> to smear him as, as a Russian yeah. agent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hell of a coincidence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. this this is the playbook, right? Yeah, yeah, and this is the playbook, and and you know, and you know, there were there were 
tenuous connections, often one way between more odious groups and, and the America First Committee, right? I mean, there were fellow travelers, um, there were members of, of the Silver Shirts who were in the America First Committee, but it, but but the playbook is to amplify those connections, right? It's to strip them of their context. As far as historians go, it, it's to it's to dehistoricize them, right? And also, it, it it helps to erase the like the longer history of non interventions, right? So so whenever whenever well whenever popular people or you know popular historians write about the America First Committee, they don't talk about War One or the Spanish American War, you know, or the half century of political development that started with the Spanish American War. Where people said like we don't want to fight, we don't want to. You know, this isn't our. You know, so often for reasons that were less or less than admirable, but often for ones that we would agree with, right? Fear of uh, centralization of power, you know, the the perversion of of American governance and and the like. And unfortunately, you're seeing, you know, this is this is one of those aspects where it does rhyme. Where yes, you know, yes, there, it's a big country. Right? You're going to find some Putin apologists, uh, you know, some somewhere somewhere in this country and on Twitter. But the goal of the interventionists now, as then, is to, is to amplify those connections, not to, not to uh, you know, complicate them, right? And for the purpose of erasing the, the past twenty years of, you know, the debacle in the Middle East, like we, you know, we treat, we, we treat this question of NATO expansion as if it just ha- <laughs> as, if, as if it just happened yesterday, but this was a political issue in the '90s, like before Putin even came to power, right? I mean, people were ringing the alarm about this, and you know, I think. A, a lot of populists and certainly libertarians have been fed up with this project for a long time, particularly since since the uh, GWAT. And now that it's it's entered this this next act in um, in Ukraine, and you know maybe Taiwan, God help us, like that dissent is erased because of the efforts of the interventionists to play up you know fairly small connections and 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 and, and make them more than they are. Yeah, I have this radical view that um, it is both true that. Putin is is an awful um, monster, and I would love to see him go away. But I also don't think that the United States should be sending hundreds of billions of dollars in weapons to a conflict that's none of our business. Yeah, and it, we don't have we don't have we don't have a tragic sense of history uh, in this country. And I think because of the Second World War and and, and the narratives that come out of it. You know, we see all foreign policy since then as, as existential Manichaean, right? Even think about how the how the war on terror was sold, right? Islamo fascists and and all that. And these people were treated as if and these these groups were treated as if they were a existential threat to the United States, which is which is utterly absurd. And we're 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 hearing the same thing now um, with, with 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 Putin and and in his designs in Eastern Europe. And you know, yeah, you don't obviously you don't have to like what he's doing or his foreign policy just to realize that you know, this is a you know a imperial competition between the russian federation and, and the u.s government like this didn't come overnight yeah I, I can't think of the historian's name you probably know exactly who it is there's a there's a cato scholar who had written a book about world war one oh, yeah jim powell yeah yeah great. and yeah. it's such an eye-opening yeah. book that i i didn't even realize the, the nature of it, you know, you have all these elites in, in the military and the government and, 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 you know, fat cats, corporatists in, in cahoots with them, sort of playing a brutal game of chess with all of these people that they're just sending soldiers into the meat grinder and they just keep going and going and going. And it, there's, there's no, like, reason or logic to it, and yet it just keeps going. Yeah, there is an awful, there's an awfully disturbing, you know, bureaucratic inertia that comes up with these things, right? I think especially since the White House has backed itself in a corner by presenting this as an existential threat, right? He can't, well, I mean, and frankly, I don't think it really matters who, who, who the president who the president is. Like they, I think much of the same logic would probably be, be the same, right? You know, we can't let, you know, this guy win, you know, air, air quotes. So it's going to, it's going to force, it's going to force this government and in, in to, you know, keep, to keep grinding it on. I think especially after Afghanistan, right? Because you know you can see, you can argue that uh, American foreign policy has kind of had two lanes, right? One Wilsonian, and one I guess you could say Rooseveltian, right? And the Roosevelt project that comes out of World War, World War II is is you know is like the internal improvements, right? We're going to make the world safer, democracy, nation building, all these projects and stuff. Yeah, you know, much you know much of these logics were at you know were at play in Vietnam, uh, and I think Afghanistan just nuked that from orbit, uh, and that. I think there's a, there's 
there's almost no appetite for that. So if if Putin can redraw the borders of Europe against the will of of the Western world, the, that Wilsonian portion of that project goes to. So in that sense, it is existential because you know the powers that be have walked us up to this point. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. So somewhere I was reading one of your pieces and I, I get the impression and I correct me if I'm wrong, but your, um, your personal history as a soldier in Afghanistan is, seems to have inspired your second career <laughs> as a historian yeah. of, of war and war propaganda. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so uh, I, I enlisted in the military right out of high school. I, I enlisted before 9-11. Um, I foolishly re-enlisted uh, after, uh, in, into the National Guard. I got deployed. I uh, saw, you know, saw the war right as it was um, re-escalating um, in the summer of 2005. Uh, thankfully, I left without seeing sort of too much action, and you know, and, and I was starting to sour on it then. Um, but after I got my undergraduate degree, I I, uh, I took a job in the intelligence community and uh, worked there for six years. Went back to Afghanistan a bunch, did a bunch of shorter tours there, and then saw the war in its you know in its full in, a, in its uh, full uh, reescalation. And so that coupled with just the waste, fraud, and abuse that one sees in government, um, you know, soured me pretty quickly. Not only on the state, <laughs> but also on on the global war on terror, and I didn't I didn't want to be put into a position to support these things anymore, so I decided to leave. Yeah. Um, what was is there any particular stories that you can share that was your moment like this? This is not what I signed up for. This is not what they said it was going to be. Yeah. So I saw uh, I saw Commander order one of his. Um, one of his, I, I worked, I worked in like an operations center, and I saw a commander order one of his subordinates to falsify intelligence in order to justify an operation, and I was, you know, I was, I was, you know, scared. Uh, I told my boss, and he basically said, "Yeah, that happens sometimes," and uh, and it, it didn't go anywhere. Thankfully, nothing, nothing came of it of, of that particular incident. And so, you know, not only was it seeing that which disturbed me, is the fact that I was unwilling to go further. In reporting the incident, right? Like I had you know, kind of a, you know, um, kind of a Hannah Ardent moment, right? Yeah. And I like, oh, I, I don't want to be in a position where I have to see these things again, and and you know, uh, and have to ponder what my response is. So that was it, and that, and and from there on out, I was basically, you know, plotting an escape. Uh, and I, I don't know if you if if you've read. Um, if you've read the um, Afghanistan papers, the the book that just uh, came out last year, uh, not the whole book, yeah, but I've yeah. I've read plenty of people sort of harvesting the yeah, and and I, and you know I've 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 witnessed much of that like firsthand, uh, you know just this uh, this like bureaucratic inertia, this bureaucratic incentive, yeah, to you know uh, like like even war has been bureaucratized, right? So like we need metrics, right? And you know in Vietnam it was all about kills, like we need to we need to, we need to kill a VC. In Afghanistan, a lot of it was like captures. We need to capture these terrorists. We need to, you know, terrorists, or these Taliban. We need to get them off the battlefield. And so you see that this creates the incentive to define down what constitutes like leadership. Mm -hmm. And so you're just picking up like the equivalent of like a private, right? Yeah. And, and you're like, well, what? okay, well, this, like this whole thing is uh, is not what it's, you know, cut out to be. You know, I, I try to explain this to some of my conservative friends who, um, very much understand um, the critique of big government when it comes to to central planning. Like you can't possibly replace the the, the genius of the marketplace with one person reorganizing things from the top. And they get that power corrupts absolutely. So you have a knowledge problem and you have yeah. an incentive problem. But then when it comes to police and the military, they put that aside. And they have this romantic faith that everything you're telling me just doesn't happen, that people are there for the right reasons and they're going to do the right thing. Um, but a lot of your research, which, which I haven't read yet, is, is about um, people on the right sort of 
driving the the anti-war movement Mm -hmm. kind of based on that understanding that that government fails even when you really desperately need it not to fail yeah i mean yeah so not only the anti-war movement but just this the non-interventionist project at large like foreign aid is is a is a big part of this um you know and once upon a time it was not impossible to be a small c conservative of a traditionalist stripe and be anti-war or at least skeptical of military power right there's a there's a there's a kind of agrarian logic to to that opposition right because what you know war especially mass war it it, you know it upends society right especially if there's a draft Mm -hmm. people are plucked out of their professions and they're and and they're thrown and and, you know it homogenizes um you know uh, communities and you know and the nation writ, writ large but you know over the course of what now two or three generations those earlier I'm 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 thinking particularly of, of a guy like Howard Buffett. Um, uh, I always love bringing him up to people because he's Warren Buffett's dad, and it, it's kind of just like I guess this is one of those chances where the apple fall fall fell very far from the tree. Uh, but he, he's one of these guys who was a libertarian in his in his in his um, economics, but had something more of a traditionalist view of war. He was a, he was a, a man of his faith, a, a man of a great faith. Uh, but over the course of the Cold War, you know those those sinews, those those uh, those those anti-militarist um, sentiments got you know, washed out of the conservative movement, and it was really only in libertarianism that they sort of that they you know found a home in a lifeboat in the 60s and 70s. But even during that time, you know, all throughout the early Cold War, the right wing of of the GOP held out a great resistance to, to foreign aid, to some aspects of diplomatic policy and often for for reasons that we would be completely attuned with you know knowledge problem and and uh, you know this you know, fear of, of inflation this belief that, that you can't plan you know plan economies that these things have to be organic yeah so one of, one of the uh, in one of the articles you wrote you you mentioned something that I I didn't precisely know I, I knew that Murray Rothbard had very much tried to bring together a yeah. left right coalition anti-war coalition um but i didn't realize leonard Liggio was involved Mm -hmm. and i'm actually thinking about another guy ralph rako i assume you've you've Mm -hmm. read his stuff as well i believe his origins were in the goldwater campaign yeah i think that's right is it carl hess you're thinking of um both both yeah okay Um, i i I didn't know that about yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so they you know so like the what we now know as a modern libertarian movement was kind of born as a right-wing project mm-hmm. uh, by the way i don't quite buy the right versus left thing but yeah but for practical reasons sure. they, they came out of a um sort of insurgent um you know maybe barry goldwater was the the donald trump of his time or something i don't know yeah. how exactly you characterize that well it's funny goldwater is an interesting character because he had two careers right in the senate and if you read goldwater uh if you read goldwater during his first congressional um, session. I, I think it was he, he came in um, with with Eisenhower. He sounds like a downright dove at times. Mm-hmm. There's a speech that he gave um, opposing U.S. aid to to the French because he didn't want them using those funds to put down uh, the Viet Minh in uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and he, he he compared them to American patri- patriots. They're just fighting for freedom. This is the you know, like what is this? And you're like, whoa, Barry, what happened? <laughs> but some somewhere along the way, he, he evolves into into the Cold War that we all know and love or know and tolerate. Well, maybe maybe that was part of the evolution of, yeah. of these of these libertarians sort of leaving the fold. Yeah. Well, there's there's certainly um, so the new Individualist Review starts up in 1961 uh, out of the University of Chicago. Milton Freeman is being the the uh, the faculty editor, and they dip their toes into into this question, into into the uh, into the empire question, and very they're very quickly smacked down by none other than everyone's favorite villain, William F. Buckley, and so they just drop it until Vietnam really starts to go, and then once and so once you get to sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, you see new individuals review and left and right. Uh, Murray Rothbard's uh, project start to talk about American foreign policy you know, using what what I sometimes call the I word or em, or uh, imperial or empire, mm-hmm. and you hadn't seen that kind of language coming out of the right, be it libertarian or um, or conservative since before World War II, and so so, so Vietnam really kind of really churns up uh, churns up these these narratives. And uh, one last thing about Goldwater, what's interesting is is you know he has a he has a down ballot drag. 
uh, on the remnants of the old right. So like if you look at who at who at, at who loses in '64, I mean it's just like it's just, it's all over the place. But it's especially bad in the Midwest. Uh, but it's not bad in the South. So Goldwater and his loss help helps to 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 turn over the transition where you have a mostly Midwestern old right to a mostly Southern and Western new right that is younger, that is more tied into the military industrial complex through you know contracting and and um, and all that. So yeah, so that's that. I mean that that's really a, that that's kind of the last shot. And then you and then you have libertarians trying to to parlay with with the new left. And while there were a lot of ideological um, cross pollination happening there, it didn't it couldn't take as a political project. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Kibbe on Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. So that that's where I wanted to sort of wrap up this conversation. And it, it's it's a, you know, this entire conversation could be viewed as a very depressing, black-pilled, we're screwed no matter what. Um, and I, I don't think that's true. I never think it's true. I think... I think something is brewing here, and and I'm thinking about the piece that you wrote for Free the People about the potential for a, and we'll use left and right just yeah. because I think people understand um, that spectrum, but I, I don't think that's exactly right. And you wrote that in 2022, and since mm. that time, and I think a lot of this rises out of, you call it the information state. Yeah. Um, what what is, what is the, the history of that phrase? Because I think that's a better phrase than I use the pandemic industrial complex, right. but I think it's it's about the information state. What is what is the history of that word? So as far as I know, I, I think it was coined by a historian named Maxwell Hamilton, who wrote um, a very a very thick authoritative book on the uh, CPI. It's not mine. I wish yeah. it was. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> well, we'll we'll give you credit. We'll we'll cut that attri- attribution out. Sure. So. <laughs> but so you you have this this fascinating trend over the past three years that I've talked a lot about. Of of people, um, not just from the left, but let's focus on the left. Um, true, true uh, card carrying progressives, like a guy, a comedian like Jimmy Dore, yeah, or Russell Brandt, right? Or Joe Rogan's more complicated because yeah. I've seen clips of him endorsing Ron Paul back before it was cool. So I'm right. not, I'm not sure Rogan can can really be called coming from the left, although he's said a lot of nice things about Bernie and everything else. But you have these 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 people that would self-identify as coming from the left, suddenly realizing that the government has too much power. If it can tell us what we're allowed to say, it can tell us whether or not we're allowed to leave our house. It can tell us that we must take this this medical procedure, and you don't have a choice about it. And so you have all these all these uh, red-pilled lefties coming out, um, and the the overlay. If if there's a Venn diagram of the over- overlay. These are the anti-war guys too. Yeah, and they probably were always anti-war, but now they're looking at that more more holistically and realizing that centralized government power is just dangerous. Yeah, um, that says that the Roth to me maybe it yeah. says that the Rothbard Legio project is more viable today, and it's not just war skepticism; it's it's skepticism of grand plans that 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 destroy. Um, choices and rights of individuals for the sake of the common good is what they would say, yeah, but right, for yeah. the plan, whatever the plan yeah. is. Do you, do you see that dynamic? Well, I mean, it's, I will say this, like what is different now is, um, you know, I, I would argue that the very quick span of American, American entry into World War II and then, and then, and then the Cold War created this, you know, almost this like ideological hurricane that, that, that um, destroyed a lot of these, you know, left-right um, alliances that had existed in American uh, in this country on the issue of, of foreign policy for the previous like 50 years. Uh, if you go all the way back to the Spanish-American War, you had Southern conservatives within the Democratic Party. Um, I guess we wouldn't call them conservatives, liberals, or or or, or you know, maybe small C conservatives and Midwestern progressives who were very much 
opposed to you know, particularly the occupation of the Philippines. And those dynamics carried carried uh, carried on all the way up through uh, World War One, where you had you know a, a rural a, a rural South and rural Midwest alliance on on on, on questions of the war. But that doesn't last World War II. Um, very quickly, you know, the, the liberal intelligentsia and then you know the, the New Deal coalition along with Southern conservatives uh, find themselves in the interventionist camp. And so going to the war, you had, strangely enough, a ideological landscape that looks a lot like today with people who we would now call libertarians. They, they would just call themselves liberals, conservatives, and then this rump of an earlier progressive movement that came out of the Midwest that was largely agrarian, was more nationalistic uh, and more localistic. You know, they didn't like the New Deal because they they didn't want the New Deal interfering with their own you know state-run or county-run um, welfare programs. And so, and then once you fast forward through to, to the through the Cold War, you know what holdovers are left over within the progressive movement are basically red scared out out of popular discourse. So the only people left is the rump of this of this conservative um, um, wing of of the GOP. And so Vietnam, yet again, I know, I know I'm kind of going on here, but you know Vietnam again is this challenge because of the optics of 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 the war with the Soviets. But now that we're in this, I don't know, almost post ideological world. I have a hard time seeing how you know this autocracies versus democracies language can get the same kind of ideological pull out of people, be it on the right or the left, in order to police the ideological window as uh, as as has been done in the past. At least I hope. Yeah, there's this, and so this this coalition that I'm describing, um, which which is uh, in its heart very libertarian but it's at at very least the the glue that holds it all together is sort of Mm anti-authoritarian and you get the the people that say with almost a a religious tenor um save our democracy yeah um and that that's a blank check to let the government do whatever it wants it it doesn't really matter um and then there's these anti-authoritarians that still believe in free speech like classically liberal values that that used to be sort of the, the bedrock of, of what we thought America was about. Um, that's an interesting thing. And I think, I actually think that the latest version of RFK very much fits that, that ethos. I don't, and I, I've said this publicly before, I don't know if he means it <laughs> or if he just sees a political opportunity to, to fill that space. But either way, that's, that's good news because he, the most cynical interpretation is that there is a market demand mm-hmm. for less war and more free speech. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, um, not to bring this back around to the uh, to the to the black pill side. I think the the hardest part is going to be getting these ideas mobilized into politics. Um, you know, there's 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 you know there's far more institutions now um, uh, you know, talking about foreign policy in this way. There's shows like this, whereas you know this. You know this wouldn't have been possible not that long ago, but how do you get those in, in, into political action? And if you wind the clock, if you wind the clock all the way back to to the twenties, the height of the so-called isolationist period, and that was really a detente between a largely unilateralist, um, you know, North that wanted like a strong America in the Western Hemisphere and in, in, in the Pacific, and a more progressive or you know, I guess you could say like folk libertarian Midwest, and they hashed it out. And the result was, you know, keeping Europe, keeping Europe at arm's length, uh, some kind of, um, you know, arms control projects, or you know, letting the mar- letting the market work, freezing imperial competitions in the Pacific, and then you know, various forms of primacy in in Latin America. And like, how do you how do you repeat those sectional politics in a world in in an America that is nationalized so thoroughly in terms of its politics and its media? I yeah. think that's going to be the most difficult part. Well, um, Bill Crystal at least seems to be worried that it's happening. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's, he's launched yet another political committee. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah. And I guess his project is c- to convince conservatives and Republicans that endless war is a core value for the coalition. And I do see like there's it does seem to that the the America First wing, I guess that's what they call themselves, yeah. the Trump wing, right. Is growing more and more skeptical of of endless war, um, 
and that's that's an interesting trend. I haven't seen anything quite like that. Like I was a Rand Paul guy, right? And so you had Ron Paul and Rand Paul, and then Thomas Massey and Justin Amash talking about these things, but it was pretty isolated. Mm-hmm. But now it seems safer in, in a lot of communities to talk about these things. Yeah, I mean the the trick is 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 going to be. Um, I mean, so I think certainly any kind of imperial, like any nation building projects in in the in the Middle East, I think that. That that's just DOA, hopefully for a generation, hopefully if not forever. Uh, Europe certainly. I mean, there's there's a long history of 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 Americans being upset uh, about Europe free riding on on NATO. Right. It, it only became controversial when Trump said it. Um, I mean, there's, there's there's quotes of American presidents going all all back to, to Eisenhower, saying like this this is not this is a temporary project. We're not supposed to garrison Europe. Uh, so that has a long history. Now it's it's the Pacific and Latin America getting these more unilateralist, you know, semi anti-war types on side when it comes to power in the Pacific and in Latin America. And I think that's unfortunately going to be a, a heavier lift. Uh, now, had I, had I been asked this question, you know, 18 months ago, I would also be concerned about um, the rights, you know, continued embrace of militarism or, you know, militaristic imagery like you think about even when trump was at his rhetorical best right he, he cloaked himself in, like in strength like we mm-hmm. don't win anymore right like yeah. so um well and he hired all these these crazy yeah. ass neocons because yeah. he thought they looked strong i really hope that that trump uh impersonation came out well <laughs> um but that but now that's starting to flag uh you know faith in the military is 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 the lowest it's been i think in i think since uh, what since the, at least uh, uh the Early two thousands, uh, and there's a lot of there. there you know, I, I I follow I follow a lot of you know conservative anons on Twitter, and it's interesting hearing these stories about people who are, you know, especially you know, very much rooted in like Southern military martial culture, and they say like you know I, I serve my dad served yada, yada, and then but like my son's not. Yeah. Uh, uh, same same thing with me. Like uh, you know, I, like under no circumstances will, will, my, will my son be be in the military, and and you know often the reasons are, are less than. You know, ideal from a libertarian perspective, they often talk about like like the wokeness of the military and and so forth. But even then, to see this trend amongst um, you know, well, I mean, let's be honest, it's America's martial class, right? Um, is interesting, and you know, if especially yet again to to wind the wind the clock back, it's not always that there was you know a strong martial tradition in like say the American South, um, you know, in between. It really, it really took the Spanish American War, particularly World War One, to, to get them on side, um, and so to see that unwind has it's, it's been quite fascinating. So let's let's wrap up with um, your current project. You're you're finishing your PhD, and you you publish for a lot of platforms, including Free the People, but others places like Responsible Politics, Libertarian Institute. Where can people find you and your stuff? So if you want to follow my work, you can follow me. You, you can follow my. Uh, my blog, it's uh, brandonpbuck.com. That's Brandon with an A, all one word. And if you're still on Twitter or X or whatever it is we're calling it this week, you can follow me at uh, Brandon underscore Buck. And um, what's, when do you finish your, your PhD? Uh, well, God willing, it'll be at about nine months or so. Uh, I have my most, of, most of the big work done, so I just kind of have to tighten, tighten some screws. So. What, what are you going to do when you're done? Uh, I'm leaning towards unemployment or stay-at-home dad. Yeah. Those are kind of... Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I assume that's the logical career path of, of writing for libertarian platforms <laughs> and getting a PhD in history. Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I honestly, I don't know. I'm kind of keeping my my options open right now. I'm, I'm, you know, leaning towards you know looking into some of, some of the think tanks here in town that you know that that have you know shops that are concerned about foreign policy from a libertarian or restraint position. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. joining me. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.